Okay, Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah. Hey, yeah, there. Listen, whether you're worshiping with us today at our Henderson campus or East or Effingham or downtown or Midway or Statesboro or far away on our live stream, man, we're so glad that you're with us today. And if you're part of our Compassion Christian family, then hopefully you know by now that we celebrate the birth of Jesus with total abandon and no apologies, which is why we've developed these special Christmas at Compassion invitations to our Christmas Eve services. Uh, you can pick these up at Connecting Point on all of our campuses this weekend. Uh, we've got 26 Christmas Eve services planned for Sunday night and for Tuesday evenings. And then we've got four webcasts on Christmas Day that we hope will be a blessing for you. If you want to uh, tune into that, you can do that as well. Man, I'm planning on inviting my one and everybody on my street, and I hope you will do the same. These make great fake Christmas ornaments. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can put these on your friend's tree as kind of a gag or that. Perfect for name tags on gifts, white elephant gifts, especially at the office Christmas party. These are also great for leaving on the table if you need a restaurant. You know, you can leave it for your server there if you are a good tipper. <laughs> if you're not a good tipper, do not leave anything from our church at your table. We don't want anybody to know you go to our church, all right? Uh, but I'm telling you, as crazy as it sounds, we have a church leader today because Sarah and I invited him to our church when he worked at Longhorns about 100 years ago. So I just want to encourage you to get creative, use these things, uh, get the invitation out. Because friends, I'm telling you, if it were not for Christmas, none of the other life-changing realities of our faith would even be possible. We would not have a clear understanding of what God is like. Nobody saw that fully until we saw it in Jesus. If it weren't for Christmas, there'd be no cross, no resurrection, no reconciliation with God, no salvation, even possible for people who have a sin problem like I had and like we all have. So really, man, we celebrate Christmas. We're celebrating the love that drove the Father to send Jesus to save us. And of course, friends, man, our love for God drives us as well. And that's why thousands of us are bringing a special Christmas offering this weekend for our seat at the table offering. Uh, man, our church family has been super generous from last Christmas until this uh, so that we could buy and renovate this old mattress factory down on Jones Street. Uh, and man, I'm telling you, this is turning into our new downtown campus. Man, I'm praying that every Compassion Christian will give generously because this offering is going to literally get people in heaven, uh, students, uh, young professionals, people all around the world are going to be blessed because of these gifts today. So at the end of our service uh, on every campus, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to come to the table and put your best gift uh, right here where God put his when he sent Jesus to make a seat at the table for us. Now, if you're a guest, please don't feel any pressure to participate in this at all. But let me just tell you, if you choose to, God will bless that generosity. And this is going to become a special opportunity for you and your family you know, to worship Jesus in a noble and, and really a memorable and highly impactful way. Now, I hope everybody has kids. Well, go get your children at the end of this service and bring them back here and let them help you put your family's gift on this table. Now, I, I tell you what, a friend of mine uh, told me that they were bringing a gift in the name of a child that's already in heaven today because of Jesus. And if that's your situation, you can write that child's name right here on your card today and leave it up front when you come. These gifts are going to put a lot of kids in heaven over the years to come. And a lot of people from around the world will be blessed because of our downtown campus. Now, the question that pops into my mind when we start talking about these offerings, and that is, at Christmas time, bro, why in the world would we do this? Man, why do we try so hard? Why do we give so much? And, and honestly, it's because we're worshipers of the one who came at Christmas. And man, if you're a worshiper, that makes a difference. Now, when somebody tells me they worship the Lord but it makes no difference in their lives, I'm pretty confident they don't have a clue what the word worship actually means. Because friends, the Christmas story it really is a worship story. Now the night that Jesus was born in Luke chapter two, it describes an army of angels who showed up outside of Bethlehem to announce the birth of Jesus. You know, it said in Luke chapter two, uh, suddenly, man, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Now when you think of an angel, do you think of a majestic, powerful messenger from God? Or do you think of a chubby little Cupid? Because I'm telling you, these guys were not chubby little cupids. Everybody in the New Testament that ever saw an angel was terrified. 
They were awestruck. I mean, from the shepherds who heard the announcement out on the hillside when Jesus was born, all the way to the ladies who heard from an angel about Jesus' resurrection 33 years later. But that night, the angels were worshipers, man. They came to give Jesus the honor and the glory he deserved. And then Luke 2 goes on to talk about shepherds watching their sheep out on the hillside who were told by the angels about the Messiah, the spiritual leader that the Old Testament had promised that, that he had been born and they could find him in a stable lying in a manger. And immediately it says that the shepherds, you know, left to go see this thing that had happened, which the Lord had told them about. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And then those shepherds, it says, returned. They went back to work glorifying and praising God for the things that they had seen and heard just as they had been told. Now, these guys were field hands. But let me tell you what, that night, they were worshipers. On their way back to work, man, they boldly declared the good news about Jesus to everybody they met. But there's another worship story in Matthew chapter 2. So turn with me in your Bible over to Matthew chapter 2 that is so fascinating that a Harvard scholar recently wrote a book about it. And it's a story about the Magi, these wealthy, powerful politicians that travel by caravan from the far east to bring gifts to Jesus and worship him. And that's the story uh, we're going to unpack today. So open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 1. <clears throat> Here we go. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, Where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Now, friends, just hold your New Testament open, and let's see what the text actually says about these wise men. And first of all, we talk about what it doesn't say about them. The New Testament does not tell us exactly where they were from. Uh, it says they were from the east. Many scholars believe they came from Babylon or Persia. Uh, some suppose that they came from as far away as China. We just don't know. The New Testament doesn't say exactly how many of them there were. Uh, we always think of three kings because there were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The New Testament doesn't give us any names of these guys, doesn't identify any ethnicity or any race. It doesn't, the New Testament doesn't even say they were kings. Do you know why we think they were kings? Because there's a Christmas carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are, and we all know that song. There's nothing in the New Testament that says they were kings. But here's what we do know. They probably, they didn't probably, they came from the East, I think, uh, either the Babylonian or the Persian Empire. We think they came from a distance because by the time they got to Bethlehem, verse 11 says, Joseph and Mary were not living in a stable. They were living in a house. And man, you see these nativities sometime at Christmas, you know, where everybody's at, at the stable. I mean, Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus, shepherds, wise men, Frosty the Snowman, everybody's there, you know. <laughs> and it's just not historically accurate. Jesus is called a child five times in this text. He's not called a baby at all when the wise men get there. And though it doesn't say they were kings, we believe the Magi were some kind of special royal advisors. Uh, the Magi were, were like king makers. They were highly educated, wealthy, influential men, you know, in, in the area of astronomy and astrology and science and finance and religion. Uh, there are wise men in our country who set every candidate for every party up to run for president. And that's the kind of guy these wise men were. So here's my question. How did the birth of a Jewish king even get on their radar? Well, you know, many scholars believe that when the prophet Daniel was in exile in Babylon in the 7th century B.C., that he became a leader of the Babylonian Magi when King Xerxes was leading the Babylonian Empire. Consequently, we think that maybe he taught them about the prophecy that's recorded in Daniel chapter 9 that says five centuries after Daniel was alive, a great ruler would arise in Israel and his birth would be marked by this special astrological phenomenon. I mean, the prophet Balaam in Numbers 24 refers to this. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Many scholars believe that Daniel's prophecy was so specific in terms of that time frame that the Babylonian wise men were actually watching for this sign when this, you know, star or whatever it was in the, in the heavens appeared. And so when they saw this, you know, special astrological anomaly occur within the specific time of this prediction, they believed that the prophesied king had been born. And so those brothers saddled up and they came to Israel to worship him. Now, we can learn a lot about keeping Christmas on course from these magi 
uh, and they'll help us be worshipers this Christmas. So, so if you're taking notes, write this down. Worship is demanding. Everybody say demanding. Come on. Demanding. It's demanding, man. Now listen, if you have a star on the top of your Christmas tree this year, when you look at it, let it remind you that being a worshiper of Jesus is not always easy. Think about the journey those wise men made to worship Jesus. I mean, if they were from Babylon, they might have been from farther away. But if they were from Babylon, what we would call Iraq today, dude, they traveled over a thousand miles to meet the baby Jesus. And they would definitely have needed a holiday field guide on that trip, right? Because, you know, they would have probably used horses uh, to get from Babylon across the mountains of uh, western Iraq. Uh, and then they would switch to camels when they got into the desert here. And we can assume that since their journey you know, didn't need to be kept secret, they followed the same main trade, main trade routes of the, of the era, which meant that they would follow the Euphrates River all the way up into Syria. Uh, and, and then they would cross that desolate Syrian desert. Uh, they would pass down through you know, this lush Jordan Valley that goes from the Sea of Galilee all the way down almost to the Dead Sea. And eventually they would take a, a turn to the west and when they got to Jerusalem assuming that they would find this new prince now I will never forget the first time I saw Jerusalem you know which is five or six miles north of Bethlehem it was in the afternoon uh, we came out of the east we came out of this barren countryside east of Jerusalem uh, we went into this dark tunnel man we went around some hills and then suddenly we turned west and bam man there it was I mean it's awesome I mean, we were up here on the Mount of Olives. This is the Kidron Valley you're looking at down here. And, and across the Kidron Valley is the old ancient walls of Jerusalem. This is the Mosque of the Rock, uh, which is built on the site of the ancient Jewish temple. Now, you got to remember, the Jewish temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was three times taller than the Mosque of the Rock. Imagine how stunning that would have been 2,000 years ago to crest that hill and bam, see an architectural site like that. And they would have been riding those horses and camels for the last three or four months across the desert to get to this place where they could not wait to worship this newborn king. Now, friends, that trip was not a 30-minute drive in an air-conditioned truck. That was not a, a journey or a convenient place to get to. That, that worship trip was demanding. Now, have you seen this meme? Have you seen this? I want to go on a mission trip. Dude, you don't even serve in the church nursery. Really? <laughs> Have you seen this next one? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Man, you don't even go to church when it rains. <laughs> now, dude, when you got a cat calling you out, you are lame. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I mean, come on, man. But you know, I fear sometime, you know, because following Jesus is so good, that maybe it sounds to you like follow, following Jesus is easy, or, or it should be easy. And it looks easy. I mean, doesn't it? I mean, we're sitting in a beautiful building with nice people in a climate-controlled environment with lots of assets in play that make worship as meaningful and as powerful as possible for all of us. I mean, it looks easy. But friends, I'm telling you, being a worshiper of Jesus is not always easy. In fact, it is very often hard. And if you want to keep Christmas on course, you might realize you're going to have to toughen up. You'll have to get theologically tougher. You'll have to be morally tougher. You'll have to say no to a lot of other things, a lot of good things, so that you can say, good to, so you can say yes to the best things. Man, if you want to be a worshiper of Jesus, you're going to have to rearrange your schedule. I mean, you're going to have to plan your leisure time differently. You're going to have to make and keep commitments that most of your friends will think are cuckoo. I'm telling you, man, being a worshiper of Jesus demanded from those magi a big commitment of time and money and prioritizing worship above a lot of other awesome stuff. Man, being a worshiper is not always easy. It's just always good. It's all good. It's good for you. It's wise. It can put you into a relationship with the Son of God. I mean, you've got to know, man, it's usually the hard thing that's the best thing. You know, this December so far, we've had a number of crises in our, our church family. We have a young dad in our church who was just diagnosed with a super rare and aggressive form of cancer. And then his family is, you know, getting tooled up to fight that. We've got a family in our church who had to say goodbye to their mom who just died suddenly last week. My buddy, his mother died yesterday. We've got a family in our church who lost a son in that shooting at the naval base down in Pensacola last week. Friends, I'm telling you, all of these families are experiencing deep grief this Christmas. But friends, in times like this, 
aren't you so thankful you're a worshiper? Amen. Right? I mean, these deaths are triggering great grief, and that is absolutely normal because when you love much, you grieve much. Amen? Amen. But if you're a follower of Jesus, man, you know death is just a temporary separation. Consequently, we all know folks who are spending their first Christmas in heaven this year. And we're sad, but we're glad for them. I'm telling you, man, worship can be demanding. Sometimes it's a hard thing. It's just always a good thing. Now, when the Magi got to Jerusalem, they went to the palace where they expected to find the new king. And they asked King Herod where he was because they had come to worship him. Verse 3 says, then King Herod heard this when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. All Jerusalem was disturbed because they knew Herod. They knew that man was a power lover and they feared that a power struggle between Herod and anybody else would literally bring war to their doorstep. I mean, Herod was a violent man. There was a joke about Herod in Rome during these days. The emperor said it would be, it would be better to be Herod's pig than his son, because he'd murdered two sons for fear that they might overthrow him to take the throne. So when Herod got disturbed, bro, well, everybody got worried. And it says in verse 4, when they had called together all the people, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. And then the teachers of the law said, well, in Bethlehem, in Judea, for this is what the prophet Micah has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Now, man, verse 6, as we talked about last week, is super important because this prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, was made centuries before the birth of Christ and was fulfilled exactly as predicted. It's interesting, that prophecy was found as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. All had been written centuries and centuries and centuries before the Christmas story. Then in verse 7, Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Man, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too can go and worship him. Does that sound believable to y'all? I don't think that's the motive, but that's what he said. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was and when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Now, on coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. Now, if we're going to keep Christmas on course this year, in addition to you know, accepting that worship can be sometimes demanding, we need to learn from these verses that worship is also humble. Everybody say humble. humble. Now, one of the most remarkable things about the Magi, to me, is that these are wealthy, influential, powerful men who were amazingly humble. You know, Bob Russell says that there are three indicators of their humility in this story. First of all, the Magi were men, and they stopped and asked for directions. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> when they came to Jerusalem, they said, we understand a king's been born. Anybody know where he is? Now, most of you ladies do not understand why that is so hard for a man to do. You know, when a man is lost, it's so tough to just pull over and ask for directions. And if it bugs you so much, get the brother a GPS for Christmas. Amen. But you know what the real deal is? It's pride. It's just hard for a man to go to a complete stranger and say, you know, I obviously don't have a clue what I'm doing. Would you help me figure out where I'm going? Somebody uh, asked Daniel Boone one time if he'd ever been lost. He said, no. He said, I did get turned around one time for about four days, but I've never been lost. <laughs> never been lost. Now, somebody wrote, do you know what would have happened if there had been three wise women instead of three wise men? Uh, they would have asked for directions sooner. They would have arrived on time. They would have cleaned the stable. They would have helped deliver the baby. And they would have given practical gifts. Amen. You hear that laughter right there, guys? You hear that? That's feminine pride. That's what it is. It's feminine pride. But you know, these wise men were wealthy, and yet they're spiritually sensitive guys. Friends, this is a sign of humility. You remember in Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? And then Jesus said, now look, what is impossible with man, man, all things are possible with God. Amen. You know, affluence makes it difficult for people to be spiritually sensitive because temptations are intensified when you have increased opportunity. I mean, when you're blessed, 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 your worship schedule gets interrupted because you can afford to travel. So your kids are not in our student ministry being discipled regularly. No, because their mom and dad are traveling so much. 
And then you get this spirit of self-sufficiency that can seduce you because you got so many resources. And I mean, so often when a person becomes wealthy or they you know, reach a certain level of status, well, they start feeling superior to other folks and they don't feel a need for God. But amazingly, these magi, as influential and wealthy as they were, man, they still had this humility about them that demonstrated itself in a spiritual hunger for truth and submission to God. I mean, just like so many blessed people here in our church. But here's another indicator of their humility. The wise men were mature adults, and yet they worshiped a little child. Look at verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw this child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Now, you know, when you're a person with power and influence, following the proper protocol can get really complicated. I mean, who do you bow to? Who do you bow before? How low do you bow? Who bows first? The president of our country has been attacked over and over and over again because of his disregard for protocol. I mean, the stuff he says, the stuff he tweets, man. And you know what? Protocol matters. Manners matter. They make a statement. And it takes a certain amount of humility to even learn, much less follow political protocol if you're a high-ranking official. And if you don't, it gets you into all kind of trouble. These magi, though, they're not bowing before some dignified king. They're bowing before a little kid. And he's not some prince with a royal lineage. He's a baby born to peasants. And they're not in some capital city somewhere. They're in a little old village. And, and it's not some ornate palace. Man, they're in a modest house. And I'm telling you, that's humbling and impressive. You know, a few years ago, Sarah and I saw something, something I would never have imagined I would see. We went down to Jacksonville. Sarah loves the arts and she loves plays and all that. So I took her to see a Broadway play and she was putty in my hands after that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so we go down to Jacksonville to see this Broadway uh, show. And at the end... They had a live nativity. I mean, at the end of this famous Broadway show, they accurately, biblically told the story of Jesus and his miraculous virgin birth. They unashamedly quoted the scripture. They actually said the name of Jesus in the show over and over and over again. And when they brought that show to an end, here's how they ended it. 19 long centuries have come and gone. And today he is the centerpiece of human, the human race. He is the leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that have ever marched, all the navies ever built, all the parliaments ever sat, all the kings who ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as powerfully as has this one solitary life. And I'm telling you, I was stunned to hear that testimony from Radio City Music Hall. But man, I love the way they had the wise men come in from all over the auditorium with their colorful regalia and camels and horses and expensive gifts and lots of servants and then humbly bow and kneel before the baby Jesus. Contrast that with the arrogant paranoia of Herod. Herod was so narcissistic. He was so competitive. He was so paranoid that he ordered all the male children two years old and under in the region around Bethlehem to be killed in hopes that that genocide would kill Jesus too and eradicate any threat to his pride and his power. Now let me see the hands of everybody on all of our campuses who has a baby or a grandbaby under two years of age. If you have in your family a baby or a grandbaby under two years of age, now look at those hands. Friends, think of all the grief that was caused by Herod's evil pride. C.S. Lewis said pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. And I'll tell you one reason we call these guys wise men is that they were humble enough to worship Jesus. Now, if we're going to keep Christmas on, on course this year, we need to acknowledge that worship is demanding and get some of that. Uh, we need to be humble. And then this story teaches us that worship is expensive. You know, it's interesting that the part of their worship that we all remember is their generous gift. I mean, it says in verse 11, they bowed down and they worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. Man, when we think about worshiping Jesus, you know, what we think about is singing songs and saying prayers and taking communion and listening to sermons. But you know what? The first time worship is mentioned in the New Testament is when the, New Test is when the wise men come and they offer their gifts to the Lord Jesus. Now, we hosted a party at our house this week, and we got a couple more coming, and so we're, we're in party mode right now, all right? 
But I was amazed when we hosted this last party how many people brought a gift or a flower just, just to say thank you. Now, you know, you don't bring that gift because your host needs it. You just bring it as an expression of appreciation and, and respect. And man, part of that genuine worship is offering a gift to God, not because God needs it, but because it's an expression from us to him. God, man, you've given so much to us. us. We, we disrespect you. We love you. We want to honor you. And this is why 1 Chronicles 16 says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name and bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And so friends, keeping Christmas on course means humbling yourself before God and acknowledging that he's the ruler over you and everything you have belongs to him. Now, as we study this passage, it may be so obvious, I don't even need to say it, but just to fight familiarity, we need to remember that worship is focused on Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. He's the reason, right? Look at verse 11 again. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and man, they bowed down and they worshiped him. They didn't come to see Joseph and Mary. They didn't come to see the house. They didn't come to hear the angel choir sing or hear the testimony of the shepherds. They came to worship Jesus. Friends, they traveled the miles. They invested the time. They brought the offering. They humbled themselves. And they express their praise to Jesus. And I'm telling you, man, that's what keeps Christmas on course. I mean, that's what our faith is all about. Friends, that's what our church is all about, exalting Jesus. That's the message of Christmas. Wise men, wise women still worship Jesus. So here's the take home for us today. If we're going to keep Christmas on course, I want to encourage you to make an effort. Make an effort. Man, those magi went to a lot of trouble to worship Jesus. And here we are 2,000 years later, still talk about how wise they were. Why don't you be that wise? Why don't you make a decision? You're going to have your family here for worship every week in 2020. Now, we all take vacation. I think we ought to take vacation. But all the other time, we ought to be here worshiping. And man, I want to encourage you to make that fresh start. It's right in front of you. Make it. Sit down with your family. Make a decision. We're not going to the beach on Sunday mornings. We're not going to the mountains every other week. We're not going to travel every chance we get. We're not sleeping in on Sunday. We're not going to go to St. Mattress or Bedside Baptist on Wednesday night anymore. We're not doing that. We're making an appointment with God, and we're going to keep it. I would encourage you to make an effort. That's what wise people do. I would encourage you to humble yourself. Now, friends, if we ever become wise people, the motto of our life will be, it's not about me. Let's say that all together, y'all. Come on. When I become a wise person, the motto of my life will be, it's not about me. Amen. Friends, can you imagine what this Christmas and what 2020 would be like if everybody in your family began to live by that motto? It ain't about me. It's about following Christ. It's about serving my family. It's about compassion for other people. It's about reaching my one. You know, somebody has said that joy is like an acrostic for building an extraordinary life. You put Jesus first, you put other people second, and you put yourself last. And as ironic and counterintuitive as that sounds, that's how joyful, humble people live, and God blesses that. So if you want to keep Christmas on course this year, man, make an effort. Humble yourself. And next, bring a gift. Bring a gift. Worshipers never come before the Lord empty-handed. They just don't do it. Attenders do, but worshipers don't. Friends, the reason so many people find worship so unfulfilling is they don't put anything into it. You know, they drag into church late, try to cut out early. You know, they, you know, watch the music with our hands in our pockets instead of participating. You know, instead of treating these songs like they're prayers. We may give, we may not. So even when we do, it's not an expression of discipline or devotion that we give with a sense of urgency or expectation. Man, when you don't so much, you don't reap much. And listen, the people in this church who are overjoyed with their faith, like the Magi, are people who invest in their faith. And you're going to have an opportunity to do that in just a few minutes as we bring our special seat at the table gifts before the Lord. But I think the most important thing we can do as an act of worship is to focus on Jesus. Say it with me, everybody. Focus on Jesus. Now, you've heard this before. If our greatest need was for education, God would have sent an educator. And if our greatest need was financial, he would have sent an economist. And if our greatest need was for pleasure, he would have sent an entertainer. But you know, God knew that our greatest need was for forgiveness of sin. And so he sent us a savior. You know, the apostle Paul was one of those New Testament followers of Jesus who had attacked the church 
And then he was led to Christ and he became you know, just a great servant of the church. He sacrificed because he loved Jesus so much. And when people would ask him why, he would say, you know, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Let's read this all together. Come on, y'all. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I read a story years ago about a young family in California. <clears throat> Husband and wife had gone through some terrible times, rocky times. Young wife finally got so disillusioned, so depressed with the stress of the marriage and the responsibility of being a mom that, dude, she just took off. I mean, the morning her husband found a note beside him in the bed, she gone, right? And he just agonized over her leaving him like that. But he felt like maybe she needed a little bit of space. So he didn't, you know, follow her immediately. But he did call her on her cell phone that day and every day. And every day he called, he told her he loved her. He begged her to come home. And, you know, she would listen to what he had to say. And he could sometimes hear her crying in the background. She just stubbornly refused to come home. And then Christmas got close and the young father became more intentional. He hired a private investigator to help him locate where his wife. And a week later, the detective found her in a low-budget hotel in Las Vegas. And on Christmas Eve night, she's sitting on a lumpy motel bed all by herself, dimly lit room. She felt about as lonely as she had ever felt in her life. And then she heard a knock. And it was soft at first. And then it got louder and more insistent. And finally, you know, she walked across the room and peeked through the curtain and and there was her husband standing in the doorway. And she was so glad to see him, man. She took the chain off the door, threw the door open, just fell into his arms. He had barely gotten the words out, baby, I love you. We need you. Please come home. Dude, she was throwing the little bit of clothes she had in the old suitcase. And man, they're heading for the car. A couple weeks later, you know, Christmas trees back in the attic. Kids are back in school. He asked her, why'd you wait so long to come? And I begged you to come back a hundred times. What took you so long? And she said, you know, you told me you loved me and you told me you needed me. But those are just words until you came for me. And friends, I'm telling you, 2000 years ago, the God of the universe came for you. He left heaven. He came to earth. And rather than you just hearing about how much God loves you, he decided to put it into action and show you by coming to earth himself. Now, when you really love somebody, you don't send a messenger. You tell him yourself. And that's what God did when he sent Jesus. And the Magi got it. And they worshiped him. Now, can you imagine a better way for you to get this Christmas on course than to make that gift of your life to the Lord who came for you right now at Christmas time? So I want to encourage you to come today and give your life to the Lord as a gift. Become a worshiper of Jesus. And get this Christmas on course. Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you did. I mean, from prophecies, centuries in the, fu uh, centuries in the future, uh, about the, the arrival of Jesus that would clue in people from other religions and other parts of the world that you were up to something special. Father, all this intricate activity, just so that everybody would know how much you love us, how much you care for us, how much you want, Lord, to be there for us. And I pray, God, that there will be people here today who will get that message. The wise men got it. The shepherds got it. People at the temple got it. The old man, Simeon, got it. Anna, the old lady at the temple, she got it. People saw this amazing thing that you were doing right in front of them. And I pray, God, that there will be people here today who will get it, who will realize maybe for the first time that love drove you to come for us in the form of Jesus. And I pray, God, that there will be folks who will commit to him today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen.